Let us worship God, the God of possibilities, who makes all things new, the God who goes before us and beside us and invites us to sit down and be fed. Let us sing. song to the God goes before us, making all new, leaving none the same. Sing a new song to the God goes before us, making all new, leaving none the same. Heaven and earth join to worship your Creator. Sing to the Lord, praise the one from whom you came. Heaven and earth join to worship your Creator. Sing to the Lord, praise the one from whom you came. Sing a new song to the Lord goes before us, making all new, leaving none the same. Sing a new song to the God goes before us, making all new, leaving none the same. Hi, I'm Gwen and today I acknowledge country from the World Heritage Area of Lord Howe Island and I'm standing underneath the sacred banyan tree. Whilst there doesn't appear to have been any human settlement here prior to 1788, I make this acknowledgement recognising all First Peoples who have cared for Australian land for countless generations. As we meet for worship today, we acknowledge and respect the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional custodians of this land since time immemorial. We are learning that the land is not ours to own, but to look after and that if we listen, we may hear in it the calling of the eternal spirit. Responding to this call, we commit ourselves to work for justice, reconciliation and care of the earth. Welcome to Worship at Brunswick Uniting. Welcome if you regularly join us online or in person. Sorry. Yep. Here we go. Sorry about that. Welcome to Worship at Brunswick Uniting. Welcome if you regularly join us online or in person. Welcome if you're online for the first time. We're live streaming, as you can tell, from our worship space this morning. My name's Kirsty, and I'm here with Fran, our preacher, and Ray, Sean, and Alastair, who were running the sound, slides, and live stream to bring this service to you. Beth, Bronte, Dave, Jeff, Gwen, Lillian, Mal and, spoiler alert, Matthew and Michael, have pre-recorded their parts. Today we'll be looking at stories, how we understand stories, 
and how we can change your story. Change our expectations and discover new possibilities. We will focus on two stories in particular. The first is John's telling of Jesus feeding of the 5,000 with loaves and fishes. The second is the story of David and Bathsheba in 2 Samuel. We're delighted to have Fran Barber preaching for us today. Fran is a member of our congregation and a minister of the word in the United Church. She will be exploring this confronting text in some detail and talking frankly about its content. Now, let us listen to the word as we prepare for our prayers of adoration and confession. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. I pray that, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than all we can ask or imagine, to him in the church and in Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. For these words of witness, and for Christ the word, thanks be to God. Let us pray. God, whose breadth and length and depth knows no bounds, you strengthen us and invite us to join with the saints. You are grounded in love and work within us in more ways than we can imagine. Jesus, prophet who has come into the world, you welcome us as we come to you. You are not deterred by the enormity of the scene you face. You feed us and make us whole. Spirit of life, you will empower us to rise, to rise above the limitations and barriers we see, to grow and become something new. We adore you. Forgive us when we put limits on you, when we do not love, when we are not open to your possibilities. Forgive us when we do not offer welcome, when we turn away because what we see is too enormous for us to face and we don't know what we can offer. Forgive us when we are held back by our perception of limitations, when we see only barriers, when we do not see a way to make things new. Amen. Sisters and brothers in Christ, God sees a new future for us all. She invites us to come, to sit down and be fed. And so we can say with confidence that our sin is forgiven. Thanks be to God. The first Bible reading comes from John, chapter 6, verses 1 to 15. Jesus feeds the 5,000. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. 
Then Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where should we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Jesus answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among, among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down, about 5,000 men and women were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they all had had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who was to come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. These are the words of the Lord. God has laid a feasting table So um, good morning, Lillian. Thanks for joining us on um, Children's Time this morning. That's fine. Thank you, Dave. So a um, bit of news today. We're actually talking about presidents of the UCA, not the USA. Thought you, you probably thought I was thinking the USA for a minute, but it's the presidents of the UCA. So the UCA is the Uniting Church in Australia. And you probably don't realise this, but we've actually got um, presidents, so like national heads of the Uniting Church. Wow. Yeah. So I'm going to just share my screen and show you some of them. Um, this is from going back. All right. So um, the Uniting Church uh, was created in, back in 1977, but it's actually, you know, got a, like a 2,000-year history right back to Jesus' time. Um, and so these are the presidents. I'm just going to sort of scroll through them now from the first one. So Davis McCackie. And then Winston O'Reilly. 
I have a small feeling that they're going to be white old blokes. I have a small feeling. Well, there's Jill Tabart. So she was the first female president in 1994. And that guy there, Alistair McRae, you might recognise. He was a minister at, at Brunswick, at South West Brunswick. So what do you what do you think? Well, first of all, I think there are a lot of white men. Yeah. A lot. I also think that at the end it's great to see that there are two women, not two men. Yeah. So um Sharon Hollis, who um she's been part of Brunswick Uniting Church actually, and she has just started her term as the as the national president of the church. So just uh, just last weekend she started she started she took over from Deidre Palmer yeah um, so yeah there are quite a few blokes there's some pretty amazing blokes there there's some um, Ronald Wilson who was uh, he was instrumental in the Stolen Generation report called Bringing Them Home so fighting for justice for uh, Aboriginal kids who'd been taken away um, Darcy Wood next to him uh, he helped to he, he did the coronation so putting the crown on the king of tonga a few years ago so he's a pretty cool guy he lives up in gisborne uh yeah so we've got and and davis mccacky who was an amazing guy he was also the uh the governor of victoria so yeah some really interesting people in this group but um your job lillian you didn't realize this when you came on but your job is actually to choose the next president of the uniting church so we've got a we've got a short list. We've got a short list. Oh we, no. I know, oh, I know. No, no pressure. No oh. pressure. We're down to we're down to three. All right. And these are the three choices that you've got. Viniana Ravatali or Michelle Cook or Carissa Suli. So these were the three that were nominated. Um, and they, they had an election last weekend, yeah, to choose who's going to be the next president after Sharon. So what do you think? Mm, I'm not quite sure. I don't think I've met any of them. So no. I am in a bit of a pickle. <laughs> you are in a bit of a pickle. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, what would you need to, to know about them to help you decide? I know that you have mentioned before some pretty amazing things that they've done and what they've done it for, like some people fighting for justice for our Aboriginal children. Yeah, Ronald Wilson in particular. So is there any amazing things which they've done? Well, the lady in the middle, Michelle Cook, she works up in the Northern Territory now, up in Darwin, and she's uh, teaching uh, particularly Aboriginal um, people. Um, Viniana Ravitali, she, um, her family's from Fiji and she's done a lot of work in Sydney in the Fijian community and also in a school where she was a chaplain. Yeah. And Carissa Suli, uh, her family's from Tonga, uh, also in the Pacific Islands. And she's done quite a bit of work also in Sydney uh, in the Tongan community and then also working a bit with the, the National Church. Yeah. Yeah. So... What do you think? It's over to you, Lily. No pressure, but you know you've got to choose the next, the next no president. <laughs> yeah. Do I have a time limit? Oh, uh, maybe three or four days. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I am not going to choose right now. <laughs> no. I can't see you that. No. Do you want to have a guess? Mm. I think it's Carissa. I don't yeah. know why, but I think it's. If you get it right, you get a Tim Tam, all right? Because I owe a lot of kids yeah. Tim Tams at this time. All right, so no pressure, but you reckon you're going for Carissa and you can play along at home here. See if you get it right. It'll be an honesty system. Tell your parents and then you get a Tim Tam from yeah. Dave. Radio, we're going to go the reveal. Carissa, are you? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, there she is. She's the next president of the United Church coming in 2024. How does that make you feel as a, as a um, young girl? I think it's good that there's a woman of colour 
being chosen for the first time, not just white people. What do you think Jesus would think about this choice? Mm, I'm not quite sure. That's a pretty powerful question. Yeah, it's a big question, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I think that he would probably be pleased. Yeah. I hope he's pleased. Yeah, I reckon. I reckon there's a lot of amazing women of colour in the Bible. In fact, pretty much every woman in the Bible is a woman of colour. <laughs> uh, my final little image, this one here, what do you, how do you react to this? Are these all the people from the Bible that are women of colour? Well, women? these are some of them, yeah, not all of them. And Bathsheba's, um, we're about to hear her story, part of her story uh, in the service now. And it's a really powerful, full-on one. Uh, it's quite hard to hear, actually. Um, but, yeah, she was a very strong um, woman of colour. Yeah. So, yeah, so thanks heaps, Lillian, for joining us on Children's Time this morning. It's so good to uh, get your wisdom and your uh, reactions to this news about Carissa Sully being the next president of the Uniting Church and following in a long line of great women of colour. Mm, it was my pleasure. All right. Have a great day. I hope lockdown ends on Tuesday as we as we hoped. Come on. <laughs> See ya. A reading from the second book of Samuel, chapter two, from verse one. In the spring of the year the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbi. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messages to get her and she came to him and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived and she sent and told David, I'm pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him, a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, you have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths and my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will do no such thing. Then David said to Uriah, remain here today also and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with, couch with the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. For these words of witness and for Christ the Word. Thanks be to God.
Thank you for having me this side of the camera. And just a reminder, heads up, I'll be talking about this story in frank terms, so if you've got kids in the room, just be warned. Imagine Jesus appearing on the SBS genealogy program, Who Do You Think You Are? Think about it. Jesus has got all the right credentials to risk flippancy. He is a celebrity. And as the Old Testament reading just now highlights so starkly, Jesus has got the requisite skeleton in the closet. Who do you think you are, or WDYTYA, to hardcore fans like myself, tends only to take celebrities who are found to harbour scandalous or tragic stories in their ancestry. Think convict origins or polygamy, fraud, ideally murder or overcoming ordeals. But there are exceptions. The episode on Cameron Daddo recounted a pattern of beautiful epic love stories repeated through 600 years of his line. And Lisa Wilkinson's family line is dotted with strong, defiant women who survived against the odds of poverty and domestic abuse. As a who do you think you are guest, Jesus would fit right in, I think. As well as today's story, which we'll get to in a moment, we know from Matthew's genealogy of Jesus that he's got way more than one skeleton lurking. Somehow God's redemption absorbs appalling histories like Amnon and Absalom's, just two mentioned in Matthew 1 where deception and, and abusive imperial power and even fratricide appear in Jesus' kin. So today we focus on the disturbing account in 2 Samuel about David's rape of Bathsheba. That's strong language, but I'm using it deliberately because too often the word adultery has been used of David's sin which is only very partly what's going on. Bathsheba is certainly married. We know her as the wife of Uriah. But so is David, to six women, actually, according to 2 Samuel chapter 3. African-American scholar Will Gaffney refers to David as a collector of women. What's happening here, though, is not merely adultery but an egregious abuse of power that is coercive. No consent from Bathsheba is indicated anywhere in the story. Neither, incidentally, does the story suggest she's deliberately enticing David, which dubious interpretations wanting to save his reputation have suggested. And all of this is before we even get onto the calculated murder David ordered to save himself after getting Bathsheba pregnant. Who says faith is about escapism? Although some of us revel in the scandalous stories at arm's length on who do you think you are, I'm going to take a punt that many of us have skirted past this violent episode in David's life because it's an uncomfortable problem in the biblical narrative or more seriously, simply because it's distressing. It is a distressing text, it's difficult. It's also a tale we see repeated into the 21st century. I'm thinking of Brittany Higgins and Grace Tame, the Bathshebas of our own time. If you read further into Bathsheba's story, you find she ends up wielding a considerable political influence, as Grace and Brittany do now. Or there's Harvey Weinstein, to name one contemporary man of enormous wealth, power and influence who echoes Dave, David's arrogance and entitlement. What's going on inside David that permits him to act the way he does? What's the story he's telling himself? What stories do we tell ourselves? David the king is at the height of his power when we encounter him in the story. His palace is well established. God has promised Israel an eternal kingship and the ark is securely in Jerusalem. 
The clear suggestion of the text is that David should be in battle, it being springtime. Instead, however, he's delegated to his generals so he can stay behind in Jerusalem, lounging around on his rooftop couch. To all intents and purposes, David appears to be a man of leisure. There's something sparing and inevitable about the way the event is recounted. David doesn't engage in any second guessing or any self-reflection, apparently. He simply sees Bathsheba, delegates his dirty work to his messenger to get her, and then lies with her. Note that the word get is translated from the Hebrew verb to take and is a deliberate echo of Samuel's warning to Israel about the nature of kings made earlier in 1 Samuel. These will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons, your daughters, your fields, your wealth. Coercive power will, will be, according to Samuel, characteristics of the ways of the king. So David does what he wants, when he wants it, because of who he is, king and ruler beholden to no one. He behaves as if the only story that matters is the one he's telling himself. And central to that story is his own sense of freedom from all convention or moral obligation, including any awareness that he is writing Bathsheba a devastating story of herself in the process. The fact that he goes to the lengths of murdering Uriah to cover up Bathsheba's pregnancy shows that David knows the story he's telling himself will be contested by others. He fears some sort of fallout, but he still gets away with it. That is, until the prophet Nathan arrives on the scene in chapter 12. Now I'm taking you outside the lectionary reading for today in a spoiler for next week. And I'm indebted to colleague Craig Thompson for this phrasing of what Nathan does to David here. He restories him. Who do you think you are, David? Let me tell you. And Nathan recounts a shrewd parable. There is a rich man with a vast livestock and a poor man with just one precious ewe lamb, lovingly reared by him and his family. A hungry traveller approaches, uh, approaches the rich man for one of his many sheep, but the rich man refuses, giving him instead the one precious ewe belonging to the poor man. David is outraged. As the Lord lives, this man deserves to die. Nathan's response, you are that man. What a lesson in how scripture can read us and not the other way around. In Nathan's parable, David momentarily forgets himself and what he's just done. He assumes the story's about someone else. His indignation is at the ready. And as it happens, he rightly judges the rich man. To David's horror, however, the story turns 180 degrees onto him. As recognition dawns, David confesses, and so begins his troubled path of repentance, more of which next week. A key aspect of David's story of himself up to this point is that God does not appear to be in it. Until Nathan's parable, God is not mentioned at any juncture in the story of Bathsheba. Instead, human action dominates. Desire, fear, manipulation, political manoeuvring. It's tempting to dismiss all this as the failings of one man, which they are undoubtedly, and David does not escape punishment. But are we right to resist the gnawing sense that maybe we participate in internal processes like David in some form? In his letter to the Romans, Paul talks about us wanting to do the good but being unable to, 
stuck in some internal bind that only God can get us out of, her spirit interceding on our behalf with sighs too deep for words. We really don't need to confine ourselves to extreme stories of corruption and abuse like David's to see a kind of functional atheism play out in our own lives too. We tell our own stories, and I do it too, we tell our own stories effectively leaving God out all the time, often with the best of intentions. We're so well schooled in stories of independence, autonomy and coping that society tells us the good stories to tell about ourselves. What a weight we carry when we do this. Look at Philip in today's gospel reading about Jesus feeding the 5,000. Jesus asks Philip a question to test his grasp of God's faithfulness. Where will we buy food sufficient for all these people? This is a question born of human scarcity, a story in which Philip and we all are well versed and Jesus knows this. So Philip replies as we probably would, logically, from what he knows about how the world works. That much food would require half a year's wages. It's impossible. There is a story bigger and roomier that is given to us. When we hear the gospel proclaimed, what's happening is that we are being restoried by a story that, to put it clumsily, embraces our Davidness and our Bathshebaness, our complicity with death and our suffering at the hands of deathly forces. Yes, including the suffering and triumph in all those who do you think you are histories. In John's Gospel today, the story is told with Jesus, or by Jesus, not a king who grasps power, prestige or privilege at any cost, but one who by emptying himself on a cross gives abundantly to the whole world, feeding the hungry people to more than full fullness, such that a dozen brimming baskets are left over. Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, tells the story too, in terms of expansive abundance. For Paul, what God has done in Christ restories the whole creation. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you, will, you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The beating heart of this story is the grace-filled good news that God promises goodness out of our failure and limitation. And not in some simple way, but radically through his literal death, so that we might be healed. So let us be restoried by this radical love so that our endings are thrown open and we embody God's fullness in the world. For the healing of the nations within this space Extend your grace for the healing of our neighbors. Love, enter our shattered world of tears, soothing the pain of all our loss, breaking the locks on all our fears, forging the truth inside our years in the shape of a O Spirit God, to you we pray For the healing of the nations Within this space, extend your grace For the healing of our neighbors Love, enter our lives at darkest hour Be with us as we count the cost 
Wanting to follow where you lead Painting the pictures of your power In the shape of a cross In the shape of a cross In the shape of a cross I invite you now to pause and make an offering for the work of the church in God's world. If you're able to make a financial offering, please use the direct debit details on our website. Let us ask ourselves, what can I offer? What can I give of my money, of my time, of my skills, of my love? Let us commit together to give, remembering that five loaves and two fish became baskets of leftovers, that every offering can be life-changing. Amen. Today's prayers will take up some of the themes that we've heard in our readings, as well as the theme of story that we heard in the sermon. We're reminded that the God of Israel and of Jesus is a story-making God. And I invite you to take the prayers today as an opportunity to pray that we might hear that story afresh and enter more fully into the roles that God has given us in that story. After each section of the prayers, I will offer a short period of silence, which will conclude with uh, the bidding, Lord, in your mercy, to which I invite you to respond, if you wish, in, in your context, with the words, hear our prayer. So let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. In his treatment of Bathsheba and Uriah, David twisted and rejected God's story of justice and compassion. So we pray, story-making God, for all who are the victims of those who distort, misuse and twist your story for their own gain. We pray too for those who tell God's story in public places and whose role in your story is to call truth to power. May they be bold, courageous and able to see through and call out the lies and deceit of those who claim your name, but who live by falsehoods and lies. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Jesus fed the crowds abundantly, displaying the generosity of the story that he was telling. So we pray, story-making God, for ourselves and for all who are disciples of Jesus that we may live our lives in ways that are generous, generous to the poor, to the downtrodden, to the marginalised, to the victims of the abuse of power. And we especially pray that we might grow in our generosity in word and deed to the people of Australia's First Nations. We pray too for generosity with each other in this and other nations as we endure the disruptions of the pandemic we especially pray for those whose already fragile lives are made even more so by these disruptions. Help us, we pray, to help each other and help the leaders of nations to see and respond to the needs of their people. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. In Ephesians, we are reminded of the scale of the story into which we are called, the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth of God's love. So we pray, story-making God, for the church worldwide, nationally and locally. Help us enter into this story in all its breadth, length, height, and depth, finding our unity as a church in the various roles that we are to play in your story of love. 
Help us always remember that the story you entrust to us is a story not only for us. Keep our focus on the world that you call us to serve. Where we are too strong, make us vulnerable. Where we are anxious, make us trusting. When we forget your love, remind us to love. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. Story-making God, we pray too for those known to us who are lonely, ill, fearful, for those who mourn, and for those who may be nearing the end of their lives. We commit them to your care and compassion. All these prayers we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Lord. Amen. Good morning. morning! I'm Matthew Cameron. And I'm Michael Cameron. And, and this, this is, is the BUC News. And we're back! Yes, we definitely are. So let's get started. Okay then, so the big news this week is the 16th Assembly. Ah yes, I saw Mum and Dad watching the opening service. Yes, it was quite a big weekend. I can imagine. What were the highlights? Well, Reverend Sharon Hollis was installed as President, and Reverend Carissa Sully is the new President-elect. Excellent. Anything else? The theme was dwelling in love, which Sharon reflected on in her sermon, and retiring President Deidre Palmer reminded us of the abundant grace of God and liberating hope we have in Christ. Sounds like an amazing weekend. For sure. There's links to the highlights and other important information in the UC Assembly News in the Olive Press. Great. Now on Tuesday, a very important series is starting up. Now let me think. I know. The Eco-Theology Conversations. Correct. The seven-session series is being led by Jan Morgan and Graham Garrett. Uh, but we're in lockdown. How's that going to work? Ah, it's really obvious. The first session will be on Zoom. Fair enough. Hopefully we'll be out of lockdown for the rest of the series. Definitely. Check out the Eco-Theology event on the website for the Zoom link. Here's some important news about direct giving. Give it to me. So, if you have a direct offering arrangement with UEthical, you need to set up a new direct giving arrangement. Good to know. Is there a deadline? There definitely is. 31st of July. That's not far away. Are the details in the Olive Press? Yes. And if you need any help, contact our treasurer, Sean. And now, two quick things before we cut to a video about... Emergence. Ah yes, Emergence. Our biennial art exhibition. So, the August and September roster is out and there are gaps in the welcome and morning tea rosters. What do people do if they want to join the rosters? Easy, click on the link in the Olive Press and then give Mum, that's Sadie, a call. What was the other quick thing? The August Olive Branch is being prepared this coming week. Email your contributions by Monday. Details are in the Olive Press. Great. Now let's watch the emergence video prepared by Courtney and James. Join Dave after worship for the Sunday chat session. Details are in yesterday's worship email in the Olive Press. Keep up to date with all the news in the Olive Press website and the Facebook group. Goodbye, Goodbye and, and thanks, thanks for listening. listening.
to God's expansive one so that you may be rooted and grounded in love and the blessing of the Holy Spirit who hovered over the waters at your birth at creation at your birth and your baptism and grant you the freedom of Christ in the name of God who created you forms you and loves you Amen <laughs> 